Hello everyone, how are you? I'm Mario Thirger and today I'm going to briefly talk about the Dolk Alfar, Rios Alfar and Svart Alfar, Dark Elves, Light Elves and Black Elves respectively. This is in fact in answer to one of my patrons' questions quite recently concerning these entities. The patron in question wanted to know the differences between each of these types of elves, uh, let's call them that for now, and um, what's their main purpose, if there was any purpose at all, within Old Norse and Icelandic pre-Christian belief systems in relation to these beings. So, what are the differences between the types of Dwergar and Alfar, known as Dogalfar, Ljosalfar and Svartalfar? Yes, indeed, Dwergar, also known as Dwarves, are also included in here. I was pondering about this subject if I should indeed start by speaking about these entities and their differences, or if I should first start with a video entirely dedicated to the Dwergar, Dwarves of Norse myths, and then make a video concerning these differences between them as a sort of appendix video to the main subject. However, I think it's better that we already know their differences before we jump into anything else related to Dwergar and Alfar, dwarves and elves, because eventually the designation of light and dark, black and white will come up and by speaking about that right now it will save a lot of time in a future video concerning these invisible others in the animistic relationships northern European peoples have had with the invisible populations of the land. So, with no more delay, let's get started, my dear friends. Please. Even though I will eventually cover this subject on a video, I would like to make this quick video today to help understanding the main differences uh, in a very succinct and synthesized way, of course, to have the basic notions and general idea concerning this subject. Uh, before we start, perhaps it's a good idea to remind you uh, to watch a video I've already done, uh, if you have the time, of course, uh, entitled The Supernatural Entities of Norse Spirituality, where I have talked about many mythological and folkloric entities present in Norse mythology and pre-Christian folklore of Scandinavia. That particular video is a little bit long, but I believe it contains useful information to precisely under understand uh, a little bit about the invisible populations of the world and the animistic relationships with them, because indeed uh, there's always the tendency to see mythological beings as fantasy creatures, but most of them have survived to this day in folklore and traditional folk magic because they have played a very important role in the daily lives of a variety of peoples throughout the ages. And the relationships people build with such entities of the world, not just personifications of forces of nature and uh, natural phenomenon, but entities of the land from whom something beneficial can be obtained if we interact with such entities. But more on that on that other video I've just mentioned. Um, on that particular video I have stated that the Dwerga, dwarves, were quite important beings in the Norse mythology and uh, frequently appear in the stories of the gods. The amount of accounts involving Dwergar and the long list of their names, more than a hundred different names, shows how important they were in the animistic Scandinavian mentality. So much so that they were brought into Iceland and were part of the local folklore, or became part of the local folklore, and the new mythological accounts created in Iceland. The Dwergar are not so different from the conception of Alfar, elves. In fact, they seem to be a specific type of elves, but from the land, mountains and the underground. They have been the type of 
supernatural entities of certain localities whose peoples had their own spiritual entities of place, which explains the great amount of names concerning the Tuergar. I wouldn't say they were local deities, not all of them, so some of them might have been, of course, but rather entities of the land and people presented cultic behavior towards such entities in order to create a symbiotic relationship with such entities. Most animistic beliefs and the practical displays of cult or faith or belief system towards supernatural entities are not just for fertility or any sort of beneficial outcome and as in trying to receive from supernatural entities something positive. Most animistic practical cultic activities was precisely to avoid harm, disease and death which could come from such entities of the land if they were angered or disturbed. However, it must be taken into consideration that of all the supernatural entities in Norse mythology and uh, Scandinavian folklore, the Dwergar seem to have been the most helpful and with humans have a better and uh, a generally positive relationship with. These Dwergar are generally helpful beings, but of course at occasions they can also be deceitful, treacherous, even insidious. They help, but not so willingly, and as such we see a strong personality in these uh, supernatural entities. Or invisible others. I think uh, that, that's a good way to put it, in English at least, for a better understanding. Uh, according to folklore and mythology, uh, they are very wise beings and guardians of knowledge skilled in craftsmanship, especially when it comes to the work of metals. Just as in many other cultures, the transformation of metal takes on a mystical and magical quality in mythology, and it isn't different in Norse myths. Almost all of the tools and instruments of the gods, including weaponry, jewelry, and even means of transportation of the gods, were made by the Dwergar. Dwarfs, Dwergar, live underground, mostly within mountains. As we take it from the sources, Dwergar interacted with humans almost always in a positive way or with a positive outcome. But things can become even more complicated when there are clear differences or different types of Dwergar or Alfar such as the cases of Dokalfar, Ljosalfar and Svartalfar, Dark Elves, Light Elves and Black Elves, respectively. And indeed, as I have said, the Dwergar, Dwarves, seem to have been a type of Elves. Elves are not necessarily a single type of entity, but a range of beings that enter in the category of Elves. Even human beings upon death can become elves, can become entities of the land, giving uh, benefits such as fertility, mostly in the land where they were or have been buried. But for those types of elves, <laughs> let me advise you to watch the video I've done concerning the cult of the dead in Old Norse religion. Uh, where I have developed in more detail the types of elves that were once human. Well, dark, light, black and even white, these differences do not come so much from mythology and local folklore, but rather from religion and environmental mythology. The latter signifies that even though Scandinavia is quite big and some belief systems were shared by most people, by, by many people, <laughs> there were several different belief systems which created types of localized mythology, which would eventually be incorporated into the myths in later periods, giving the impression that it has always been a, a concrete mythology known and shared by everybody, which isn't the case at all. This happens precisely with the case of 
elves and dwarves, Ulfar and Tuergar, respectively. The first Icelanders were face to face with a new environment, Iceland, with a different geographical reality, uh, especially in terms of climate, but also landscape features that do not exist in the continent. This created the necessity to adapt to the new reality, environmental reality, and for that to happen, taking, taking into consideration that the religious mentality of the first Icelanders were still quite animistic, they had to start from zero, from scratch, with their relationships with the inhabitants of the land, Iceland, both the visible and the invisible inhabitants. So, new folklore was created, new relationships with the land, new relationships with the local spirits and supernatural entities. And adaptation of traditional folk magic to the new reality, thus the conception of Alfar and Dwergar, changed in Iceland and also fused in many points. This is environmental mythology. But since the first Icelanders were actually aware, quite aware, of Christianity by this period already, in fact, that was one of the reasons that made Norwegians leave Scandinavia and settle in Iceland, this religion also had a considerable weight on the religious mentality of Scandinavians. Since at least the 8th and the 9th centuries, and more so during the 10th century. Take into consideration that Dwergar were a type of elves, Alfar, but their main attributes were metal work, phenomenal craftsmanship and living in mountains and beneath the earth. So the terms to designate different types of elves, such as Dorkalfar, dark elves, and Iliosalvar, uh, light elves, actually comes much later in Norse mythology. In fact, they only appear in the Prose Edda, written by the Icelander Snorri Sturluson in the 13th century, already 200 years after Catholicism became the official religion of Iceland. Snorri placed the Dwergar as a subcategory of elves and called them Dokalfar, dark elves, Ljosalfar, light elves, and Svartalfar, black elves, most likely because of his own cultural background, as he was an Icelander, and the nature beings called elves in general, Alfar, had a great importance in Iceland to this day, actually, the Hudelfork, the heathen people, and so Snorre must have had access to other sources concerning the Dwergar as beings of the earth, so he equated them with what he was familiar with, the elves, and called them black and dark elves, possibly due to the darkness within the earth, from the Dwergar. But we must take into consideration other points, of course. Ljosalfar appear as light elves, in a realm outside the usual idea of nine worlds, or nine realms, Heibar, of Norse mythology. This realm, Ljosalfheim, or also Holfheim, the, the latter being the earliest name, is a realm of light above all the other worlds, even those of the gods, in which there is no death. The inhabitants of this realm, the Ljosalfar, do not suffer death, they cannot die, as only the other nine worlds are governed by hell, the goddess of death. So Snorre actually makes a distinction here and places the Ljosalfar above all the other entities, including the gods. The Grimnismal accounts present 12 worlds instead of the usual 9, and the three extra worlds are higher even than those of the gods. They belong to the Light Elves, precisely. As I said, these are worlds or realms not subject to death. Hell rules only in 9 worlds. What Snorre was actually referring to when he expressed the idea of Light Elves, Ljosalfar, is the Christian belief in angels. The Ljostalfar are nothing more than angels. Again, the concept of Alfar encompasses various entities that are generally labeled as elves, and such elves have subcategories, so to speak, such as Dwergar, and the ghosts of the dead, Alfar of the burial mounds, or the Howl dwellers, or the barrow dwellers. 
and the hidden folk, etc. Los Alfar are a new category of Alfar brought by Snorre to introduce the, con the conception of angels as beings above all others and not subject to death apart from the realms of pagan entities and pagan gods, above all the pagan conceptions and completely outside. The Dokalfar, the Dark Elves, on the other hand, Snorre explains they dwell underground and their behavior and appearance is very different, even the opposite of the Eliosalfar, Light Elves. This is a mixture between the Twergar, a type of elves of the ground and the mountains, and with Christian dualistic religious mentality, creating opposites. Snorre specifically says that the light elves are fairer than the sun to look at, while the dark elves are blacker than pitch. The dualism of white and black, supernal and infernal, heaven and the underworld. I would not say that this is a specific dualism of good versus evil, not in this specific case, but it is indeed a Christian dualism nonetheless. In terms of Svaltarfar, black elves, it's simply a question of literature and context. They are literally the same as the Dokalfar, the dark elves. Dokalfar or Svaltarfar depends on the context, but it is in reference to the same types of beings, only to reinforce their darker existence and appearance in relation to their habitat in the land, as originally spirits or supernatural entities of the ground and of the mountains. The same way Liosalfar and Vitalfar, white elves, are used to describe the same beings and reinforce their attributes, behavior, appearance and realm of existence. I shall, of course, eventually develop more on this subject in future videos, but indeed, it's important to understand that light or white elves, Liosalfar and Vitalfar, are later Icelandic medieval conceptions of angels. Between the 9th and the 13th centuries in Scandinavia and Iceland, of course, there, there is a profound development in religion and folklore precisely due to cultural syncretism and syncretic faiths. A deep fusion between several pagan conceptions and, the, and, and with Christianity, especially with Catholicism. And beings that appear in Judeo-Christian myths and biblical accounts gained considerable importance within the traditional folk magic and animistic perceptions of the peoples of Northern Europe, and such entities were very much included as well within the practical animistic relationships with entities of the land. Angels became as much part of the group of invisible populations as all the other entities such as giants, dwarfs, gods, and so on and so forth, adding more entities to give some quality of life by interacting with such entities that may bring benefits to the daily lives of people. I almost forgot, uh, it's curious the fact that the term Dwergar gave origins to the term dwarf related to a small person, small in size, little people. However, this idea of a Dwergar being a small being appears at first in the medieval period, the late medieval period. A being of small stature was not current in Viking Age, actually, so the Scandinavian Dwergar weren't actually small beings, but rather the spiritual entities of the mountains, of the earth, the soils, the, the, the earth uh, beneath our, our feet, within the earth as spirits of place and spirits of metals, and the properties of metals and of the earth were the magical attributes of these Dwergar. So their actual size could vary quite a lot. They could be as small as a coin and as tall as a mountain. And this shows, yet again, an animistic worldview and a direct connection and relation between humanity and the natural world. <laughs> So, 
I do hope this brief explanation was useful. In the future, I shall develop a lot more on the Duergar, and certainly these uh, differences of light and dark, black and white shall be discussed once again. Thank you so much for watching, see you on the next video, and as always, thanks for today. Obrigado por hoje.